My name is Adrian Nanchev, and this channel is all about helping you become a remarkable entrepreneur. So as part of this podcast series, I am finding people from around the world doing remarkable things with their life, pioneering, pioneering and crafting the life they want to do, reducing the regrets, being the person they want to be, and doing remarkable things in the world. Today I have with me Bob and Kelly Ballard from Working Class Publishings. So please... Tell me, I'm very curious, tell the audience at home, what do you, as co-founders, what do you believe? What's your story? You know, why did you start Working Class Publishing, and what difference are you making in the world? Uh, well, that's that's a big question, but uh, essentially we've been an independent publishing company that's been active since 2012. We originally wanted to start publishing fiction, literary fiction. Uh, but after a chance encounter with some incredible photograph photographers, we've uh, we've developed a niche market of vintage lifestyle, custom culture, pinup photography, uh, and we've really been active in that market since. I don't know if we're changing the world, but what we're trying to do is. Uh, provide high quality publishing to artists that may not be well represented otherwise uh, you know give give artists who are doing a really good job a chance to get published uh, and all the while make high quality books that are better than what you'd see elsewhere on the market all right so we're talking purely use photography books that uh or, or just paint, books of paintings then, yes? Or is that uh, the, simplifying it? Uh, photography books. So our major releases right now are Girls by Shannon Brooke. Uh, Shannon Brooke is a well-known photographer based out of California. Uh, she's been in the industry for, for years, and her work is remarkable. Uh, she was the first person we approached to do a photography book with. And she took quite a risk with a, an independent publishing company that had never done a photography book before. But Girls turned out beautiful. It's uh, it, it's really an amazing piece of work. Uh, the collection of photographs is stunning. Uh, our second book was Stocking Seams and Lipstick Queens by Claire Seville. She's a British pinup photographer. Um, her book focuses on you know, the dichotomy between what she calls good girls and bad girls. It's got both a classic cheesecake uh, feel and more of a fetish photography vibe. Okay. Yeah, throughout. And then just this year, we released Shannon Brooks' second book called Vroom, which is uh, hot rod photography. Uh, and not it's not traditional hot rod photography. It's more of a contemporary um, car book. It's throughout. It's various types of vehicles with pinup models, but it's done in a modern, contemporary style, very editorial. Oh, oh interesting. So, uh, tell me then, why is it you started your own publishing company back in 2012? After college, I worked for a publishing company in California. Uh, actually, it was a, a legal publisher, and we edited law books. Uh, designed for lawyers. I have a I have a background in literature from the University of San Diego, and uh, so I spent some time with a publisher. Uh, after that, I, I've you know Kelly and I have had regular jobs. We we now live in Wisconsin, and we wanted to do something that fulfilled us creatively, uh, and publishing was a good fit for that. We started simply. Actually, the first book we ever published was my own novel. Uh, we did that for a couple reasons. One, because the the issue with owning the rights is pretty clear cut, and it, it was a good starter to to publish your own work. Uh, but we never intended to be just a vanity press for my own work. We always intended to publish the work of others uh, as a traditional publisher. So uh, we actually had a hard time finding fiction that we wanted to publish. And a chance opportunity to meet Shannon really got us uh, into this business that we're in now. Oh, all right. okay, interesting. So 
With regards to these books that you do publish, what does it look for in a photography book? Well, what we want is a, a unique voice. There's a lot of photographers out there, and a lot of them are doing good work, but it's not necessarily anything uh, unique or, um, I don't know, uh, it, we need more than good pictures. What we need is a voice that's representative of, of what the artist wants to tell. Yeah clear point of view. Yeah, uh, so that, that point of view is, is what we're looking for. So something, like all pieces of art, it you know I, I want to have an emotional reaction to it. So pictures of pretty people isn't sufficient. Uh, it's got to be good art. All right, okay, so... All right, so what kind of emotions then we're talking about here, which makes a good photography book? I mean, like, do you want purely... Are you looking purely at things that are controversy, that polarize the market, or things that spur emotions in the customer, or things that people uh, can fall back on, or what, what, what exactly we're looking at? What exactly, what exactly is your definition of good photography art? Uh, well, it's hard to say. Uh, my definition of good photography art is the same as my definition of good art, which is hard to define in general. Uh, <laughs> Like those, these types of things, it's more of a you'll know it when you see it situation. But when I say an emotional reaction, I don't mean that it's going to make me mad or happy or anything in particular. What I want is to feel a connection to that piece of art. Uh, it somehow speaks to me in a way that I feel emotionally connected to it as, as an artwork. Uh, whether that's happy, sad, angry, it, it, it somehow affects me on a way more than just a picture on a piece of paper. So how do you think that can be encapsulated in more than just a piece of paper? Uh, it's a good question. So, you know, we uh, I'm an artist myself, actually. I, I do paintings on oil canvas. So what, what I'm always trying to do is, you know, go beyond just blocks of color uh, and shapes and light. So, And it's the same with photography. Uh, so you consider things like subject matter, uh, and when you're doing portrait photography like we publish, uh, who's in it, it's posing, styling, lighting, uh, wardrobe, uh, things like hair and makeup are so important in a, in a portrait photography piece uh, that, you know, I, I had no idea before we really got into this business, all of the nuance behind it, so... Uh, so what I want to see in an end product is just something that uh, tries to go intellectually beyond a picture of an attractive person. And why is that exactly going beyond just that? Why, why do you think that's important? Uh, Kelly, do you have there's, any? there's a lot of pretty pictures out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can see those anywhere. Yeah, everyone's got a camera in their pocket now, so yeah. uh, their photography is not hard anymore, uh, just from a practical standpoint. You know, when when Kelly and I were young, uh, it was nobody. You didn't have a camera. Having a camera was a big deal. Uh, now everyone's got a supercomputer in their pocket with a camera they can broadcast directly to the entire world. So I'd say there's a lot more material out there than ever before. Just pure pictures uh, so in order to stand out as a photography artist you really have to know what you're doing and try hard and be committed to it and be committed to, to advancing and changing and always trying to improve your own work uh, it's one of the things we love about Shannon's work is that she's constantly developing as an artist uh, she, she tests herself she tests her own limits uh, she tries new things with different people. All right, so I'm very curious then. About the artists and the photographers that you do work with, what kind of challenges do you think they face, you know, to get to get the mainstream or to be known or to carve a monopoly or a niche of, the, of, of, of their own in, in the marketplace? And how do you help them exactly? Because publishing, for me, I'm very naive. All I can imagine is that you edit and proofread the manuscript... Well, there's no manuscript really, but and then you, then you print it. You maybe you might get it on the platforms and, and, and organize the distribution, 
but that's very naive, no doubt. But what do you do exactly for the artists? Uh, well, fundamentally, it's not much more complicated than that. So to answer your first question, uh, what do artists struggle with? This is what all, it's what artists have always struggled with, trying to make a living in the creative arts. Um, you know, it's it's not a steady paycheck. It, you need health insurance, this, which is an entirely different subject here in the U.S. Um, they trying to get paid regularly for doing a creative endeavor is always going to be difficult and always has been difficult. How we try to help with that is to support a person's work, uh, put them in a position to where they can get paid royalties as part of their their career. And what we do is just that. We, we take their work. We work with an artist to make a collection. Uh, some artists want us to take more control over the final product. Other artists want to be deeply involved in every aspect of it, and both of that's fine. We're never going to put out a piece of work that the artist isn't happy with. As a publisher, we're granted the rights to publish the book in any way we want, but we're not going to put out a bad book that a photographer is unhappy with. And that's how we keep good relationships with photographers. Then once we once we develop that book and we put everything exactly how we want it, we have it printed and we make that investment. Uh, right now in the publishing industry, you know, we're, we're a traditional publisher. We make all the investment and we pay royalties to our author. If you go online, there's any one of a thousand quote unquote publishers who will charge an author money. They'll say, hey, if you pay us money, we'll publish your book. Uh, these are essentially scams that a lot of people fall victim to because they're so eager to be published. Um, so with a traditional publisher like us, because we're making that investment, we can't publish every piece of work. Uh, if we wanted to go around ripping people off, we could tell people to pay us to publish their book, and we would we would certainly make a lot more money. <laughs> but uh, that, that's not the business we want to be in. So... What we want to do then is sell these people's books, these authors' books, uh, photographers. We want to sell them on the open market, and we want to make a profit from that. And then we we pay royalties on that profit to the artist, and that's our goal. So that so that they are actually earning some profit from their artistic work. All right. So you you mentioned it a little bit there with regards to other publishers out there scamming people, asking for upfront free up front fee but then doing nothing for the sounds of it or not much at all for the actual author so I'm very curious then because I'm in the middle of writing or just recently started writing my second my officially second uh, non-fiction work to do with marketing and uh, inbound marketing and a little bit of psychology and content creation and I've done some very basic uh, just google searches on publishers because this one this one and the books before has all been uh, in, um, independent you know, just get the manuscript done, slap it onto Amazon. Admittedly, that's uh, that's very naive, very, 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 very basic and simplistic. So, what are some good signs of a good quality publisher? You mentioned that you see the author and their work as an investment. So that that to me says that a good publisher will have some skin in the game. Well, if a publisher is not investing in the work, I don't know how they're considering themselves a publisher. Um, because that, that's the entire premise of the publishing industry is that we as the publisher pay to have this work created. We sell it. And because of that, we're, we're earning revenue, uh, that gets split with the author. So the only reason it makes sense to me for a publisher to make money off of other people's work is if they put up the investment and they put in work into it. Uh, it's never seemed fair to me that someone would profit from another person's work without, taking any risk or doing any work. Uh, when, when you're looking for a publisher, the so the most important thing to, to understand is uh, publishing is all about niche markets now. Uh, even major publishers have so many different imprints uh, to break off into different niches. It's because certain brands do certain types of books, and that's how they stay relevant, and that's how they stay profitable. Because uh, of us, if we don't sell books, we can't make more books. So uh, I know it sounds crass to talk about 
revenue and finances when it comes to art. But the reality is if we don't sell books, we can't make books. So so how is it are you selling books and how is it you how do you promote the books that the author, the authors have created? Uh we we've tried to stay as independent as possible. So naturally Amazon is a worldwide distributor of books and they've got built-in uh system for you know it's a great system they've got however they take tremendous amount of fees off of every sale. Uh, we find that our authors will get more money if we stay independent and we do distribution ourselves. However, we're going to sell less books quantity-wise, but we keep more of the money that we sell by doing it ourselves. Anytime you get a distributor, they take a large percentage of, of all the profits off of that book. Uh, and so ultimately, that just means less money to your author when when you're paying distributors. So we do all of our own distribution all of our books can be purchased on our website or from us at events. Uh, and that's how we do primarily do our sales. We we promote online and we we do face to face at events. Uh, I see. So I'm guessing then for distribution you're using things like Ingram Spark, you're certainly not using Amazon or KDP. Um sorry, what else is out there? Tell me about your distribution if if that's okay. No, uh, our distribution is just that. It's our website. Uh, we. It's us. Yeah, it's us. <laughs> we're we're a small business, so when you order a book from us, we're gonna pack it up and ship it to you. So who actually does the printing? You know, the actual printing mach- press and machine. Oh, okay. Yeah, we work with major printers, and we yeah. secure all of the products. And then we warehouse it and do the dis- distribution. Yeah. So, so printing is essentially manufacturing of books, the same as any other manufacturing industry. Um, so we we send our our book off to the book manufacturer. They create it. They ship it back to us. We then distribute it. So. Right. So speaking of which, uh, what are you working on now as a company? You know, what, what what's next for you? Well, we have a, a couple new books coming out. So this Christmas, uh, we have a little bit of a different book. It's uh, Cherry Dollface, who's a, a well-known YouTube personality uh, who specializes in vintage hair and makeup and lifestyle classes online. Uh, she's really a go-to source for everyone just getting into the vintage lifestyle and custom culture scene. Uh, and she's got such a great personality She's beloved by her fans, and we met her last year and pitched a book idea to her, and we've got one coming out this Christmas. It's not a photography book. It's actually a sort of a manual for young pinup models or anyone who wants to get into the custom culture scene, uh, hair and makeup, lifestyle, instruction, that sort of thing. So I'm guessing then with Cherry Dollface, it's better especially from the publisher's point of view, that the author has already got a community and already got a following behind them. Absolutely. We actually, we're just a, an independent publisher. Uh, we don't have that big of a online presence. You know, we, we try to stay relevant on social media as much as we can. But in terms of marketing, we're really relying on the strength of the author's following. Uh, same with all of our other authors. You know, they... Uh, they generate the sales more than anything. But then so. I, I can't help but think, why would someone, if they would have got the community and the following, why would they want to bother with a publisher? Because they've already got, the, they might not have the idea or the know-how to create the book, admittedly, and they got the audience, which is a buyer. So why would someone always need a publisher? Well, it's a great question, and we're always very upfront with our authors when we're we're discussing books and contracts. But self-publishing is is a relevant source of publishing right now. You know, ten, fifteen years ago, if you were a self-publisher, that was kind of a joke. But because of you know essentially the internet and the the availability of tools and marketing 
and social media. Uh, some people have been very successful with self-publishing, and we honestly recommend it for a lot of people who are just getting into putting out their own work. That being said, these types of books require a pretty substantial investment. And they're a lot of work to put together. Yep. So they take a lot of capital, and they take a they take a good amount of experience in regards to formatting the book and book creation. Uh, so, so these are the things we we help provide to people. So we're providing investment into the work. We're providing experience. Uh, we also do all the distributing. Uh, we we do the marketing and the the uh, the events, uh, all of that. So we do sales. So what we're relying on from the author is to get those people to buy the book. Uh, We do, I guess, basically the rest. Yeah. (laughs) So it sounds like they have, the the author has the the template or the default audience to work with, and then you just try and scale it up. We go into these events and creating creating the exposure and facilitating that discoverability. Uh, Yeah, so we also, because we publish multiple books, it's helpful we we don't make the same book over and over. So each of our books has a different audience. Uh, and certain people, like people who would buy Claire Seville's book, maybe didn't know about Shannon or vice versa. So we're opening each artist up to the other artist's audience, uh, which is, is helpful in book sales for everyone. So a, a person who comes to us to buy Shannon's book will also buy Claire's book. Uh, and and that that helps everyone as a whole. I see. And um, speaking of speaking of different audiences with different products, you mentioned that you pitched to Cherry Dollface a book idea, a book concept you had. What? Well, firstly, what do you look for an author for you for you to actively approach them and to pitch them with a book? And how does that fit in with creating? You know, not doing the same book twice. Well, we, we try to stay relevant on who's in the scene, who's doing what work. Uh, we're always following people's work and, and checking out how they're progressing and uh, what what they're doing, what's new. Uh, and there's just people out there that we're fans of. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I was always a fan of Shannon Brooke. That's, there's no question. I was excited to meet her the first time we met her. Uh, and now that, that being said, just because you're a fan of someone doesn't mean they're they're that great of a person. <laughs> uh, or that they're interested in making a book. Yeah, or at all. So it wasn't until we met Shannon and realized what a great person she is that we even considered pitching a book idea to her. Because uh, we're not we're not just selling someone's book. We're, we're really partnering with them to, uh, to create a book and to sell a book. So... Uh, we don't, we, we do get the rights to publish, but really we're partnering with authors. So that partnership is important. They have to be someone we can work with long term. They have to be someone who's willing to put in the work themselves. Uh, because if you're just relying on us completely and you don't want to do any work, it, it, you're not going to sell a lot of books that way. Okay. So what kind of challenges do you face then as a publisher? Uh, the, the one challenge is always getting books in people's hands. It's always trying to reach new markets for people who are interested in our product. So we're, we're always exploring new ideas, trying different things, going different places. Going to different events. Uh, so yeah, the, the challenge is getting people to buy books. When you say new things, such as what? Because one principle that I learned in business is that you always want to look at how things will be sold 10 years from now and try and do that today so when you say like new ways and new ways of getting a book into people's hands what kind of you know what do you see is wrong with the book selling market today for example Uh one i one one thing i see wrong and we have a called place called waterstones in the uk which is equivalent of barnes and noble and people can go into the store Look at the look at the book, check it out physically and all the rest, and then they can they can quickly very easily go onto Amazon dot com, check out the reviews, see what people think, and maybe buy it from there. And I believe that's a loss, like a, a loss lead almost for for Barnes and Noble. Well, I don't know what the logistics are over there and the infrastructure, but certainly in Waterstones over here in England, where there's no call to action to then say if you like this book, 
buy it on our website, waterstones.com, at 20% cheaper or something like that, and it gets delivered to you rather than buying it in store. So using that store, that physical storefront, as more of a showcase as, uh, you know, as opposed to an actual shop. Yep, that, that's a problem. That's a problem here in the U.S. too. Uh, traditional retailers, brick and mortar stores, as they call them here, uh, they they're always struggling with people just pulling it up on Amazon and buying it there instead of buying it in the store. At a fraction of the price. So uh, that's not really an issue for us because we don't uh, operate a retail store. So the only place to currently get our product is from us. Uh, so what we struggle with is getting that, get, getting a uh, word out there that our product exists. Uh, so we're, because we do niche marketing, so our product isn't really appealing to the mass market per se. It, it's really to the, the vintage lifestyle scene. So we're, we're always looking for new events, uh, re- new events related to the scene that we're trying to sell to the niche market. Uh, now when it, when you're talking about selling to people in 10 years, that is something we definitely consider. So right now there is an existing and longstanding custom culture scene. We go to events like Viva Las Vegas, which has been going on for 20 years and people go there and we sell a lot of books there and it's a great time. And the, the people at that event know what we do and they like our product. Now, we go to these other events, and they're different. So especially here in the Midwest of America where we live, the scene is very, very new. There's a couple of pinup models around, and people don't necessarily understand the product here. But we do try to do events locally and throughout the Midwest because I I believe that the people uh, will understand this product and there will be a bigger scene here in the, the coming years. In, in the book that I'm writing... I talk about um, what I call the so what test. So what? Um, which essentially means that whenever a potential customer comes across a piece of content or a product, that unless it passes the so what test, they're not going to care. And if they don't care, they're not going to buy. With regards to the niche, as well as pivoting, if you want enough, that's the, that's the plan, pivoting into other areas or other niches, how do you get people that may have never bought a photography book or people that may never have bought Shannon's book but they bought other photography books to care about photography books in general and all the books that you're publishing? Uh, We try to to have a variety of products that appeal to different people. So a few weeks ago we were at a, a, a large car show here in Wisconsin and we know that people at that car show are interested in old cars. And we have an excellent product for them, which is Room by Shannon Brooke, which features a number of cars and beautiful models. And the people who come to look at that book didn't necessarily know they were interested in portrait oh, photography yes. or pinup photography. Uh, but when they see a book like that, because and they, they pick it up because they're into cars, uh, they now, you know, have maybe have an understanding that, wow, I really like this type of artwork. And we have a number of other products available for them to check out once they do. Uh, so that, so our goal is to keep a variety of products that are consistent with each other that really promote the other products in that way too. And do the authors that you work with actively know this from day one? Yeah, we, we're very open and upfront with our process. Uh, and everyone knows that this is still a small and relatively new business, but the more authors and the more books we get, the better it is for everyone uh, in in our house. So, so when we release Cherry Dollface's book later this year, uh, she has a very wide market, which is great for sales of her book, uh, but it's also great for the sales of our our existing catalog. Uh, in addition, Cherry's a great model. She's actually featured in the other books we've published. So there's a lot of cross promotion there. She's one of the models who is in Vroom and exactly. stocking seams. So if people like her, they can also buy books that contain pictures of her. Okay, I see. And that's a very interesting strategy as well, where you, you, you're kind of embedding 
Like from a psychological level and a marketing perspective, you you're taking what your core product is and you're embedding it and wrapping it around other things that people are more familiar with and have more of a connection with. So in that case, cars, and you're selling it to them. You're selling a slightly different product, but that's that still still they still they still recognise it. It's still recognisable product. So it's like a hidden or unknown need or desire or interest. That's an interesting um, interesting way. Of I don't know how cutting I don't know how cutting edge that is, but that's a fascinating way of putting it. Yeah, I don't necessarily think we're doing anything cutting edge. Uh, <laughs> if anything, I'd say that we're old school and that we, you know, we we keep things very simple. We pay our authors. We're exceedingly honest with everyone in in our dealings, and we run a business just trying not to screw people over. Want to make a good product, yeah. and we want everybody to be happy with it. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the way forward. You know, it's like if you do honest business. You know, it's word, good word of mouth. People come back, reoccurring customers. Whereas a scammy business, it works in the short term, very short term. People find out, word of mouth, bad reputation. You mess with the wrong person. Who knows what could happen? It's some crazy, crazy <laughs> stuff out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's a it's a small scene, a uh, relatively small scene. So if we were to to start trying to rip people off, everyone would know pretty quick. Uh, actually, our, our most recent authors uh, agreed to work with us just based on the recommendations from our previous authors uh, because they know that we're trusted by someone as, as respected as Shannon Brooke. Uh, other people are more willing to work with us when maybe they didn't even know. And that means a lot to us. It does mean a lot to us to, to have that people's trust that we're going to do right by them is very important to us. Ah, cool. So, uh, as speaking of trust and you know, doing right, uh, as we begin to wrap this interview up, what can photographers do to get started on publishing a book that publishers like yourselves would accept? Uh, it's a great question. We actually meet with a number of photographers all the time who ask us that exact thing. Uh, we can't publish every photographer that reaches out to us, but we're happy to meet with people and explain to them what they need to focus on and what they need to do. And really what, from our standpoint, from the independent publishing market, what we want is that unique voice. We also want to do books that are specific. Uh, so we did a hot rod book. We, so I want to, I want a book that reaches a very specific market and has, has a theme per se. So I don't want to just publish somebody's collection of photography. Uh, you know, they're, I don't want to publish their portfolio. What I want is for them to really consider the pictures as a group. Give me, give me a theme, give me an idea that I can then market. So it's hard to market. Hey, buy this bunch of pictures. Uh, uh, it's a random assortment. It's easier to market something like, Hey, here's a, Here's a book, uh, a book of car pictures, or here's a here's a fetish book. Here's our our book coming out next year uh, in April by uh, Lars Kamendespot out of Minneapolis. Minneapolis. Uh, he's really well known in what's called dark pinup, uh, which is still got that vintage lifestyle feel to it, but it's it's much darker. It's uh, he shoots all in natural or found light. Uh, it's it's not necessarily fetish or uh, it has a like darker that. feel to it. It definitely would appeal to like a goth crowd yeah. that darker, but it still fits in with the rockabilly scene. Yeah. So it ha- really has that crossover of a bunch of different types of people like it. Yeah. So with his book, it it's got a it's got an idea behind it. It's got a central theme that you can market. And that's what we'd be looking for. So have an idea of, of how you're going to sell this book to people is what we would want from an author. And you're also looking for books that complement your existing user base as well as other books you've published before? Correct. Mm-hmm. All right. That sounds, sounds very smart. So, <laughs> Well, it's, it's very specific, which is why we don't publish a lot of books because it's got to be the, the right book. Exactly that. You don't... You, Three inches deep and three miles wide. Oh, wait. No, this is the way around. Sorry. Three inches wide, three miles deep. Very specific. Very specific audience. That's it. 
So, um, what is the best way, as we, as we as we wrap this up, what is the best way for the audience to get in touch with you? Uh, well, through our website. So, we have um, all the information that's needed on our, our website in regards to sales, books, products, contacting us, submission guidelines. Uh, it's workingclasspublishing.com. And it's our online store. It also links to our social media accounts. So that's, that's we really recommend everyone check out the website. And if they have any questions, they can contact us. Yeah, great. I'll include that in the link below in the descriptions. But uh, Bob and Kelly, it was great having you on the show. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thanks a lot. Um, a very interesting talk. I don't know too much about publishing, but... That's that's not that's not going to stop me. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, we're still we're still learning too. So there's always, a... always got to be learning. Never stop. Yep. But for the ladies and gentlemen at home, if you haven't already and you're watching this on YouTube, click on the subscribe button below and press the bell notification right next to it for the latest uploads. Because this channel is all about helping you become a remarkable entrepreneur. So go out there today and do something remarkable with your life because that is what it's that is what it's all about how cool is that